Hi everyone, I'm Shri, I'm your English educator for grade 11 and 12. Today we're going to get back into the lesson that we started on Saturday. But before we do that, I just want to tell you two really quick things. First, our regular class timings are from 3 to 4 every day. Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays are grade 12 and Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays are grade 11. Because of some technical difficulties today, our class has been pushed until 8. But from tomorrow, it will be at 3 again. We'll also be having the occasional class that is not at these times. Um, that will be for revisions, grammar, extra work and things like that. So keep an eye out for those. Second, you should know that today's class is pre-recorded. This means that I've already recorded the class and when you're watching it, we won't be able to interact directly. I know that's going to be a little bit of a problem. So instead, what we're going to do is I'm going to keep a very, very close eye on the comments. If you have a question about the chapter, if you have a question about something that I said that maybe wasn't clear enough to you, if you have a question about something that you want to discuss a little further, or if you have any sort of feedback or you want to tell me about what class you want next or something in specific in English subject, in, in the English subject that you want to study, then let me know and I will definitely look at it and I will do my very best to respond. Feel absolutely free to ask questions. Okay? That said, let's get back into the lesson. Today we're getting back into the second part of the last lesson by Alphonse study, which we started on Saturday. For those of you who maybe miss, missed the lecture on Saturday or those of you who watched it but it may have slipped your mind a bit, I'm just gonna give you a very quick five to seven minute recap of the things we talked about last time. So first, for some context, Russia, which is present day Germany, Austria and Poland, these countries used to be called Prussia once upon a time. So Prussia has overtaken, it has invaded this specific town called Alsace, which is a border town in France. That's context that we need to know in order to be able to understand this story. So we have two key characters in this story. One is our narrator. He's a schoolboy called Franz and he's a little schoolboy. Our second character is someone called M, Amel. M stands for Monsieur, which is Mr. in French. It's a mark of respect. And Monsieur Amel is the school teacher. So that tells us that the setting is school. Now, what's the story so far? So the story starts like this. We open on France and he is late to school. And he thinks, do I really have to go to school today? Not only is he late, he also has a test in grammar that day and he is not prepared for it and he doesn't want to go to school and get scolded. So he is thinking about just maybe staying outside because the day is so beautiful. Except then his sense of responsibility kicks in and he decides to go to school after all. Except when he goes to school, he finds that school is very odd that day. Usually it's very loud in school, all the students are shouting, they're saying their lessons together, a lot of things are happening, but today it's very quiet. And for some reason, Franz notices that not only are his classmates in school, all the villagers of Alsace are also sitting and in the back benches of the school. This doesn't usually happen. So wondering what's going on, Franz goes and takes a seat. And that's when Monsieur Amel announces to them the terrible news that they've received from Berlin. Berlin is the center is a center of Prussia. So it's news that they've gotten from Prussia. And they've gotten this order from Prussia that from now on, only German can be taught in schools in Alsace. So French, which is the language that they've been learning so far, is no longer allowed to be taught. 
Because of this, today is going to be their last French lesson and Monsieur Amel will be leaving the next day and their new German master will be coming instead. This is very devastating news for everyone. They are very heartbroken about this. But Monsieur Amel carries on with school as usual and at one particular point he asks Franz to get up to recite the grammar rule. Now this is the test that Franz didn't study for. So when he gets up and he starts speaking, he stumbles immediately. He makes a mistake and then he is very very embarrassed and he feels really really bad. And Monsieur Amel says, it's okay Franz. I know that you haven't taken your education seriously, but it's not just you. Your parents also haven't taken your education seriously. They've been thinking more about how maybe you could go to work and get some extra money for the family. And Monsieur Ramel says, I also haven't taken your education very seriously. When I could have come and taught you in school, some days I just felt like doing other things, so I just gave you a holiday. So Monsieur Amel says that all of them are really responsible for the way that they've been taking their education too lightly. And he also says that all of Alsace is the same way, that all of them have assumed that there will always be a future in which they can learn all these things. But now Russia has taken over and it's forbidden them from learning France. So that opportunity, that future opportunity that the people of Alsace thought they'd always have is no longer there. And this is the tone of the entire story. There's a lot of sorrow and there's a lot of regret. It's the, it's the feeling that comes when you thought you could do something tomorrow, but tomorrow you find out that it's no longer an opportunity that you can take anymore. That said, let's get into a couple of themes that we've discussed. This is the story so far that we've discussed and we also discussed some themes last time about the story that we've read so far. And so I'm going to just go over those very quickly also. So last time we discussed the power of language and the role of education. We spoke about basically why does Prussia choose to impose German on France, on Alsace. What is the meaning in that? Why are they stopping these French people from speaking French? Language is a way for people to connect to each other. It's a way that people get to know each other. It's something that they've lived with for a very long time. It's something that they have an attachment to, it's something they associate with being part of a specific country or a specific place. And so, when Prussia takes over France, when it takes over Alsace, what it's doing by imposing German is telling them, you are no longer a part of there, you are now a part of us. So it's separating them from France by imposing German on them. And this is very devastating to the people there. And how does Prussia choose to separate the people of Alsace from French? It chooses to target a school. It chooses to prevent not just the speaking of French in the streets or something like that, but it chooses to prevent the teaching of French in schools. This means that it that Prussia is recognizing the role that education can play in people's lives and it's trying to, there's an entire generation that is in school, right, that's just learning French. And it's trying to build up the, that entire generation in the line of German instead. And this is something that very commonly happens when it comes to wars and invasions and conquests. People take advantage of education to push their own agenda forward. People also manipulate language like this. They try to institute a particular language to, to establish their power and to show their power. This is a very common tactic that Prussia is now employing in Alsace. So those are two things that we discussed. And another theme that we discussed is a theme that concerns Franz and Amel and the villagers and the other students in the story. And it's that feeling of responsibility and regret that they're all feeling. They're feeling like they should have been more responsible until now. They should have learned their language better. And they're feeling regret that they didn't take advantage of their education. 
so a lot of very complicated conflicted feelings that are going on it's a very human tendency right to fail to take advantage of something that's right in front of you and then only notice when it's gone but it's still a very heartbreaking feeling so that's the third theme that we've discussed so far so that was our very quick recap and now we will get back into the lesson so how we'll do the lesson is we'll read a paragraph or a couple of paragraphs and we'll try to explain it to ourselves we'll try to understand what's going on in those paragraphs and then when we're done with the explanation bit we'll go on and discuss some themes that the paragraphs have thrown open to us okay okay <coughs> oh before we get into the lesson um one last thing is something that i asked at the end of the last lesson of our last lesson i pointed out how throughout this story everyone seems to connect being french with knowing the language french so there's a connection between language and belonging to france so language and nation and language and belonging to a specific community i wanted you all to think about what your thoughts on what your thoughts are on this question do you think language allows for more belonging do you think language is very important for belonging how do you think language and belonging are connected that was the question i posed at the very end of our last class i don't know if some of you already have answers but you will have an hour more to think about it because we will come back to this at the very very end of today's class okay then from one thing to another monsieur amel went on to talk of the french language saying that it was the most beautiful language in the world the clearest the most logical so monsieur amel after he gives his speech about how everybody in alsace is responsible for the way that they've not really put any investment into their education and learning their language he goes on to talk about the language itself and he says it's a beautiful language it's so logical he is talking about the grammar of it and the structure of it and he is saying it's so logical and it's so clear it's so easy and it makes so much sense so he is praising the french language and then he says that we must guard it among us and never forget it and then he gives an instruction to the people of alsace he says we have to make sure that we keep our language safe and we have to make sure that we remember our language even if prussia has taken us over even if we are not allowed to learn french anymore we still have to make an effort to keep remembering it somehow and why is that because when a people are enslaved as long as they hold fast to their language it is as if they had the key to their prison so monsieur amel also tells them the reason that all of you have to keep knowing french is because as long as you know french there will still be the possibility of freedom in your lives even if you're under the control of prussia this is a very interesting thought and we'll come back to it when we're discussing the themes then he opened a grammar and read us our lesson I was amazed to see how well I understood it. All he said seemed so easy, so easy. So Monsieur Amel then opens his opens the book and he reads a lesson to the class. And Franz, who struggles with school, as we know from the very beginning, and who doesn't really like school and who doesn't really like studying, for the very first time, he finds that it's really easy to understand what Monsieur Amel is saying. and he is extremely surprised by it he repeats so easy twice like he didn't ever expect that it could be so easy i think too that i had never listened so carefully and that he had never explained everything with so much patience and franz analyzes why it is that today of all days it seems so easy and franz realizes that it's because he himself is paying a lot more attention to the lesson than he ever has before and he realizes that monsieur amel is also explaining with a lot more patience a lot more calmness so because both teacher and student are doing their roles better the process of education ends up being more successful it's 
seemed almost as if the poor man wanted to give us all he knew before going away and to put it all into our heads at one stroke. And Franz thinks that it seems as though Monsieur Amel is very determined to give these students as much as he can and to put all the information that he has into them before he has to go away the next day. Now it's not actually possible for some for Monsieur Amel to give them every bit of information that he has before he goes away. But the feeling that this sentence gives us is that Monsieur Amel is also desperate to make the most of this situation just as the students are desperate to make the most of the situation, which is why Franz is listening so very closely to what Monsieur Amel is saying today. Okay, so first let's look at this specific theme where Monsieur Amel is praising the French language. He says it's the most beautiful, it's the clearest, it's the most logical. That's a lot of superlative, very, very extreme compliments, right? But it's also very sincere from his end. He really believes all these things. And it's also it also reminds us that it's a very desperate moment. It's that moment when he realizes, okay, we're not going to be able to speak this language anymore. And this language is important. And he's trying to communicate that to everyone else in the room. And he's trying to convince them of it. And in the process of inspiring them, he also compliments the language a lot to try to highlight how beautiful it is and to highlight why they should like it, why they should admire it, and why they should keep speaking it. Our second theme is this one. Because when a people are enslaved, as long as they hold fast to their language, it is as if they had the key to their prison. Now, what does this mean? Does it mean that language is literally some way for them to beat the Prussians? No, that's not what it means. It means it goes back to our conversation about the role of language in these people's lives, in everyone's lives, really. It's a way for us to talk to each other. And it's a way for us to get to know each other. It's a way for us to connect with each other. And it's a way for us to belong to a specific community. It's a way for us to belong in a specific place. And when this other language is imposed on us, it's an attempt to separate us from that sense of old community and old belonging. And here, <coughs> sorry, and here, Monsieur Amel is trying to tell them that as long as they hold on to that old sense of connection and to that old sense of belonging that existed in their language, that their language will give them, then it's possible for them to still hold on to that, that feeling of being part of the same community and that feeling of being part of France also. So in a way, language becomes a way to hold on to their past. Language becomes a way to hold on to that old place that they belong to. And that, that sort of emotion that's connected to language becomes the way for them to escape their prison. Which is to say, sometimes when we're stuck in very difficult positions, and it's very impossible for us because of conditions outside of us to actually escape the, those conditions. Like Alsace for now has been captured by Prussia and they've been captured, defeated, presumably it's going to take them a long time to actually be able to battle Prussia and win their land back for themselves, right? So they're in a very difficult condition, a condition that can't be escaped easily. So in this position, the best that they can do is find some way to stay connected to the people that they used to be before they've been captured, before they've been shut up in this, this metaphorical prison, of course. Um, it's like if you've had a very difficult day and you know there's no way of escaping the day because there are just a number of things that have had that have happened that day and that you've got to keep doing that day then a good way for you to escape that moment is to remind yourself this is just a moment and this is a really bad moment but 
these are all of the things that I am outside this moment. I can be so much more than this. And that sort of reminder that there is more than this can help you sort of feel a little more freed from the conditions that you're in. It's actually one of the best ways to feel the most freed from the conditions that you're in. So that's the kind of understanding that comes to us from this specific set of lines. <clears throat> And finally, one last theme that we see in that passage is that sense of mutual responsibility. We see Monsieur Amel trying harder to teach them better. And we see the students trying harder to listen. And we see how students and teachers and the, way, and the ways that they both act are important to how a school system works. So it goes both ways. I'm just going to grab some water before I continue. Yeah. After the grammar, we had a lesson in writing. So they finish, Ms. Yoramel finishes reading them the lesson. And then now they're going to practice writing today. That day, Ms. Yoramel had new copies for us, written in a beautiful round hand. France, Alsace. France, Alsace. So what is a new copy? A copy is a sample of whatever these students are going to write. So think of it as maybe something written on a sheet of paper that the teacher hands out to each person and then everybody looks at that and copies that down in their own notebooks. Um, so what has Monsieur Amel chosen to write today? He has chosen to write France, Alsace and France, Alsace. We'll talk about that too in a bit. Um, beautiful round hand, by the way, it doesn't... It means beautiful round handwriting, a cursive handwriting of sorts. They looked like little flags floating everywhere in the schoolroom, hung from the rod at the top of our desks. So France looks at the new copies that Monsieur Amel has given them and he says, they look like little flags. This is an interesting comparison and we'll talk about this too in a bit. But for now, all we need to know is that they're hung at the top of the desk of each student. So that sheet of paper, imagine it being hung and they look like flags, so rectangular. You ought to have seen how everyone set to work and how quiet it was. The only sound was the scratching of the pens over the paper. So again, Franz reiterates that everyone very dedicatedly starts working and it's really, really quiet. The only sound that you can hear in the classroom is the scratching of the pens over the paper. It's that, it's that pin drop silence that everyone keeps asking you to to enact in class and it never happens right and it especially also never happens in their school France tells us how loud they are all the time but today is an exceptional day so it happens <clears throat> once some beetles flew in but nobody paid any attention to them not even the littlest ones so some insects fly inside the room and Normally, people would be very distracted by things like this, by even the smallest of things that happen, smallest of things that give you a chance to look away from your books and think about something else for a moment. But today, nobody looks at the beetles, not even the tiniest kids in the classroom, in the school, <coughs> the littlest ones, who worked right on tracing their fish hooks, as if that was French too. So these little ones are also not distracted by the beetles and that's very surprising too because little children are the ones who get distracted the most, right? <coughs> or so Franz thinks. Um, and um, Franz says even the littlest ones are so focused on their work and what is their work? They're tracing fish hooks. This isn't actually a fish hook, it's something called a setio and we'll talk about that too in a moment. On the roof, the pigeons cooed very low, and I thought to myself, will they make them sing in German, even the pigeons? 
So France is thinking in this moment, even these pigeons that are making this noise, are the Prussians going to force the pigeons to also sing in German, just as they're forcing us to speak in German and to learn German? That's something we'll also come back to. Now, this is just some of the words that I explained in the previous segment. Um, written in a beautiful round hand, as I said, means cursive handwriting, a curved handwriting. And fish hooks are sedia, and sedia is basically this fish hook like shape. And they put it at the bottom of letters to indicate that the word has to be pronounced in a specific way. So that's what a sedia is, and that's what the little ones in the classroom are practicing. They're practicing. Sort of like you start by practicing the alphabet, they're starting by practicing those little marks while the others are writing these big, big words. So our first question that we raised while we were reading that paragraph, the words that he chooses are France and Alsace. Why? He could have picked any word at all for their last lesson, but for them to practice, he chooses two words, France and Alsace. It's the same kind of feeling that comes from the moment when he says, remember your language and you will stay free, right? It's an attempt to remind them that if they practice their language, they will remember where they belong. They will remember the nation, the state that they belong to, which is France. And in this moment, through writing too, they're going to write it for the last time, Alsace and France together. They're going to show, it's one last act where they can show that they used to belong to Alsace, which used to belong to France. Even though from the very next day, Alsace is going to be under the control of the, the Prussians, even though it's no longer going to be with France, this is one last way for them to rebel against that conquest by Prussia. It's a way for them to show that they can still be themselves, still be French. It's a show also of patriotism, which is devotion to your country. And we know that particularly because France tells us that these grammar copies on which France Alsace is written, they look like little flags. What's a flag? It's a symbol that connects to a specific country, right? Um, so it's a reminder that France Alsace this act of writing France Alsace, this act of speaking French, writing French, all of it connects back to the notion of nationhood and which state, which country these people belong to, which is France, which is Alsace, which belongs to France. And it's a, it's a patriotic act. It's an act that's meant to show I belong to France. It's a sort of proof that they belong to France. And that's why the grammar copies are compared to little, flag, little flags also, to remind us of the connection between language and the nation, between these people and the language and their nation. And a reminder that even if they've been taken over by Prussia, they're still French. And then Franz thinks this very interesting thought. He thinks, will they make them sing in German, even the pigeons? And this is a very casual thought in some sense. It's like when you're in a desperate moment and you think, will this happen to everyone else also? And Franz listens to the pigeons which are cooing as they always coo. And Franz thinks, are they going to force the pigeons to sing German also? And this isn't something that can actually happen, right? It's not possible to make pigeons sing in German. And that's why this comparison is very interesting because by comparing the pigeons to the people of Alsace who are now going to be forced to speak in German, what Franz is doing is Franz is pointing at how pigeons always coo and the only thing that they can do is coo. That's their natural organic way of making noises. And that sort of tells us that these people of Alsace They've been speaking French all this time, and that speaking of French is also their organic, natural way of living. French is what 
they do. It's what they've always done. And now the, the Prussians have come along and they're forcing them to do something differently. And it's as strange, as ununderstandable as trying to make a pigeon sing in German. So that's what this comparison tells us. Whenever I looked up from my writing, I saw Monsieur Amel sitting motionless in his chair and gazing first at one thing, then at another, as if he wanted to fix in his mind just how everything looked in that little school room. So as Franz is doing his writing practice, he keeps looking up at Monsieur Amel and he sees how Monsieur Amel is just sitting very still in his chair and he is looking around at the entire school room. He's looking at all of the things there, like he wants to remember everything. Fancy. Fancy here means imagine. For 40 years, he had been there in the same place, with his garden outside the window and his class in front of him, just like that. So, Monsieur Amel right now is sitting in the chair and the garden is outside his window and his class is in front of him. And this is the same position that he's been sitting in for 40 years, that very same place with those very same things around him. Only the desks and benches had been worn smooth. Franz is telling us, in all this time, the only things that have changed is that the desks in the school room have become smoother because they've been used over time. The walnut trees in the garden were taller. The trees outside had grown, and the hop vine that he had planted himself twined about the windows to the roof. And the hop vine, which is a kind of plant, it's a vine, that Monsieur Amel himself had planted was going around the windows now to the roof. So the plant also has grown. And Monsieur Amel has planted this plant, suggesting that he has really made a life in this place. You know, to the extent that he's planted in the garden and he's grown things in the garden and he's helped those things grow, just as he's been helping the students grow and watching the students grow. So this is his home. How it must have broken his heart to leave it all, poor man. To hear his sister moving about in the room above, packing their trunks. For they must leave the country the next day. And France tells us that Monsieur Amel must be heartbroken because not only is it true that from the next day he won't have a job anymore, he also has to leave the country, he has to leave everything, he has to leave the home in which he's lived for this long and go. And we know from this line, to hear his sister moving about, about in the room above, that Monsieur Amel has actually lived on top of the school room. That's where he has been living. And that's the things that he is going to have to pack up and leave along with the school. And this paragraph reminds us that throughout this story, although there is a lot of politics in the story and there are a lot of big questions in the story, there's also a very deep sense of personal loss in the story. And it's the personal loss not only of France and the villagers or the people of Alsace or the people of the French speaking people of Alsace, the French community there, but also of Monsieur Amel who is losing a lot. He is losing his livelihood and he is losing his home. But he had the courage to hear every lesson to the very last. But despite the fact that this is such a painful day, Monsieur Amel decides to prioritize his classes, decides to prioritize the education, and he is brave enough to carry on until the very end. After the writing, we had a lesson in history. So they finished the writing, they have another lesson, and then the babies chanted their ba, be, be, bo, bo. So after that, the babies, this isn't actually the babies, it's, it's the littlest children in the room, they chant their Ba be bi bo bu, which is the phonetics there. It's it's like chanting the alphabet. Down there at the back of the room, old Hosser had put on his spectacles and, holding his primer in both hands, spelled the letters with them. 
this reminds us that at the back of the village, the back of the school room, the villagers are still sitting there. And old Hauser, who's the one who brought his elementary school book with him, he puts on his spectacles and he opens the book and he's also spelling the letters and chanting with the babies. He's chanting the alphabet with the babies. You could see that he too was crying. And as he chants them, he's crying. His voice trembled with emotion. And his voice is shaking with the crying and all of the sorrow that he has right now. And it was so funny to hear him that we all wanted to laugh and cry. And all of these kids who are listening to him, you know, his voice is shaking and he's an old man and he's saying the alphabet. It's a very funny scene because old men saying the alphabet is a little odd, especially when they're in the classroom where there are children and there are like the smallest children saying the alphabet. And this really old man is saying it with them. But even in the midst of the funniness of the scene, it's also really tragic because his voice is shaking and even though that also makes it a little funny because imagine someone saying the alphabet and their voice is sort of shaking and the alphabets are shaking. It will make very funny noises, right? But despite that, it's also really, really sad and they also feel that sorrow and they also are split between laughing and crying. Ah, how well I remember it, that last lesson. Franz tells us that he really remembers that last day very, very well. All at once, the church clock struck 12, then the Angelus. The Angelus is the church bells, they're ringing for a prayer. They're ringing to say this is time to pray. At the same moment, the trumpets of the Prussians returning from drill sounded under our windows. So three things happen at the same moment. First, the clock strikes 12 and then the church bells begin to ring to indicate that it's time for a prayer. And then the Prussian soldiers who were drilling at the very beginning of the story, they finished their exercises, their training, and their trumpets sound from under the window, indicating that the Prussian soldiers are right under their window. So all of these moments come together. Monsieur Amel stood up, very pale, in his chair. I never saw him look so tall. So Angelus is the church bells for prayer. And this is an ending, right? And this is all of the feeling that comes with an ending. The tears, the courage, the memorability of it, how well it is remembered because it's an ending. It stands out in our minds. We, we try our best to remember it better as it's happening. And also that very dramatic final moment, all these things happening together at the same time, it strikes 12 and the prayer bells begin and to indicate the victory of the Prussians, the Prussian soldiers sort of pass under the school windows at that moment and the noise of their trumpets blares. So the triumph of the Prussian soldiers also in that moment and all of the drama of this comes together for the conclusion. And throughout this all, how does it end? It ends with Monsieur Amel standing on his chair and he looks very pale. It's a moment of deep distress for him. But he has never looked so tall, meaning he has never looked so respectable, so strong, so proud and so brave. Standing tall with pride, you know, with your chest out and your head up. You're not bowed down with grief. My friends, said he, I, I, but something choked him. He could not go on. Monsieur Amel tries to say some last words to them, but he can't. Something's choking him. The feeling is choking him. And so he stops speaking. And instead, then he turned to the black took a piece of chalk and bearing on with all his might, he wrote as large as he could, Vive la France. Because he can't speak, he turns to the blackboard, he picks up a piece of chalk and he writes on the blackboard, Vive la France, which means 
long live France. Bearing on with all his might means he is carrying on with all his strength. He is pushing forward with all of his strength. He writes this on the blackboard. Then he stopped and leaned his head against the wall. So he, just like he couldn't keep speaking, it's like he can't keep going. He can't look back and see them. So instead he just leans his head against the wall in a moment of exhaustion of, of the finality of the moment. And he says, and without a word, he made a gesture to us with his hand. And he waves at them to say, school is dismissed, you may go. And that's how the story ends. Long live France is what Vive la France means. And those are the last words of the last lesson. Now, there are some broad themes that we can conclude this chapter with, right? Um, when we were talking in our previous class, we talked about the many meanings that the last lesson, the title has, what this last lesson means. One of them is that this is the last lesson taught by Monsieur Amel. One is that this is the last lesson for France by Monsieur Amel, the last lesson of French for France, and the last lesson of French in their school and in Alsace. So a lot of lasts. And now that we've finished the story, we know that there is a lot more to this lesson, right? It's not just the last lesson of French. What they learned today is not limited to learning just French. They, when Monsieur Amel gives them an inspirational speech about French and how they should remember it and why they should remember it, all of the feelings that they've been having today about the, the regret that they've been feeling that they've not made the best use of their time, their desire to learn more of French, the sorrow that they won't be able to learn more of French. All of these feelings are also things that have taught them today. They're also things that have made an impact today. So today they've learned a lot more than just the actual subject matter. They've learned about the relevance of language. They've learned about the relevance of education. They've learned also about patriotism and how to stay connected to their country, how to stay themselves even in the midst of conquest, even in the midst of war, even when other people are trying to control them, they've learned a lot of things. And all of those meanings are encompassed in the title, The Last Lesson. So these are all of the things that they learned on their very last day with Monsieur Man. Now, another thing we should definitely talk about with regard to this story is that this is a very, very political story. It's a story about big decisions by a big, big political actor, which is Prussia. But it's also a very, very personal story. Um, even though it's about this huge decision that Prussia makes about not allowing Alsace to speak French anymore, the way that we're told this story by the author is by looking at the lives of these specific villagers, and especially Franz and Monsieur Amel. So we zoom into these two people, these few people, and we look at what happens to them because of this very big decision made by political leaders. And this is a very good way of showing us how all of these big decisions by governments affect people. And it's also a very good way of showing us how very often governments make these decisions knowing that they're going to affect people in specific ways. For instance, when Prussia makes this decision to forbid the speaking of French, it's looking to achieve a very particular goal, which is trying to make Alsace part of itself and remove it and separate it culturally and linguistically in terms of language, also from France. So it's also, this lesson is a way for us to start paying attention to policy decisions, to big political decisions, and think about the agendas behind them, what sorts of motives they have, and what's their purpose, what are they trying to do to people, how will it impact people. All of these are the big, big questions that this lesson throws up for us. So those are some very, very huge takeaways. With 
with that said there is one more thing to talk about with regard to this lesson and that is about language and belonging this isn't immediately in the lesson but it's an idea that the lesson hints at and we should discuss it um so throughout this lesson we've been learning that language is a way to build belonging right we've learned that it's also an important way to build belonging and this makes a lot of sense imagine for instance if you're traveling and you enter a country and all around you people are speaking a language that you just don't know they're all communicating to each other easily and you can't understand them then in the middle of that you are going to feel a little alone and you are going to feel a little like this is a strange place and you are strange in the middle of all of that so in that sense language is a way for people who've lived in the same place to kind of know each other and to kind of communicate with each other with a lot of ease but that doesn't mean that language is the only way to build belonging and that's why this question is important we have to remember that there are other ways to build belonging you could learn the language maybe but maybe also even if you don't learn the language of this new place that you've gone to you'll still find a way to make a home for yourself there and that's important to remember because when we prioritize language to a great great extent it can be also a little bit dangerous so take for instance monsieur amel's speech in which he says that french is the most beautiful language there it's a very sincere sentiment he really believes it and it's very true for him he thinks that it really is the most beautiful language and that's okay for people to think people will think that the language that they're used to speaking is the most beautiful language and it's the best language out of all of the languages around but where it becomes risky and little bad is when you take it to an extreme right if for instance someone said my language is the most beautiful language and so everybody has to learn how to speak this language or else they won't be considered a part of this country anymore that's where it becomes a little dangerous and that's what the germans sorry the prussians that's what the prussians have done in this case they've imposed german on alsace they're forcing them to speak their language and that kind of over emphasis on language that kind of paying too much attention to language and thinking of it as thinking of it as the most important thing can lead to situations like this where countries try to impose a specific language on all the people of the land even if the people don't want it where countries try to impose where countries try to basically say that one thing is better than the other and that's where it, when it comes to language too things can get a bit dangerous risky there can be discrimination there can be bad situations i'm sure you can all think a lot of examples of things like that so that's something for us also to keep in mind that we need to have a kind of balance between really really appreciating and understanding and enjoying the languages that are around us and ensuring that we don't become impositional in the way that we are with them that we don't make other people feel bad if they can't speak them and things like that i hope that makes sense um with that we come to the very end of the last lesson um i'm just going to check the time so i was going to do some mcqs today for us i thought that maybe it would be good for us to revise that way but i think we're almost out of time so instead we will have a revision session in which we do all of the mcqs and for now what i will do instead is i will wrap up the session if that's all right with you so i'm just going to skip by the mcqs really fast try not to look at them yes um okay um before you go i just want to let you know that an academy has a plus subscription um that basically means that you'll get access to a lot of extra courses a lot of extra content you'll also get used get access to free study material 
in PDF format. So all of that's really good and if you're interested then you should definitely go ahead and get yourself a subscription. <coughs> These are all the different durations for which you can get a subscription. Um, as you can see the price reduces, uh, the per month price reduces the longer you take a subscription for so you should keep that in mind uh, if you're thinking about getting a subscription and you should also keep in mind that I have a code that you can use it's THAR01 um, you can basically just put that into the Unacademy app when you are accessing it and you will get a flat 10% off on Unacademy Plus. You should also know that there's a lot of other content on the app that's free too. There are special classes conducted by people and things like that. So you can go ahead and check out that free content on the app and then as you go around it and you see the other kinds of content, if you enjoy it, then you can get a subscription. And there is also something called an Academy Iconic. Um, now this is like an Academy Plus, but with a lot of extra individualized features. So you'll get one-on-one -on -one guidance from educators. Your parents will get access to educators to speak about how you're doing. You'll get weekly reports. So it's like a one-on-one, -on -one especially for you, education um, plan and if that's something that you're looking for then Iconic is the way to go and these are the prices for uh, uh, Iconic and again you can take it for varied durations of time and again the per month costs differ based on the duration of time that you take it for so that's something that you should look at while you're making this decision. Um, that said if you enjoyed today's content, do like, do subscribe, and do comment if you have any questions at all or any feedback for me, anything you want me to improve about the way I'm conducting classes, um, anything you'd like me to do differently, things like that. See you next time.